close enough, we'll figure it out. Yeah. It could be our musical motto, I think. Well, initially close enough, we'll figure it out. And then later on, I can't remember what the problem was. There. <laughs> uh, or, or I can't be bothered. There's more problem than, than answer. <laughs> Fatalism and negativity. <laughs> oh. Right, well, let's introduce ourselves in case anyone, in case there's someone listening to this who doesn't know who and what we are and what we've done and why we need to apologise. So we're collectively known as an axis of perdition. My name is Brooke and I made vocals and other horrible noises. And I'm Mike and I made other horrible noises, including but not limited to uh, guitars and keyboards and just general weird weird sounds and sample manglings and uh, household objects and so on. And trombone. And trombone. They're not on this album. Um, never, but, uh, never forget the yeah, trombone. Never. So, it, uh, and then at this point it was just the two of us, though we did, uh, we did find more people to, uh, to share the blame later on. So let's have a, a little listen to the song. had to turn it down quite a lot otherwise it was distorting everything it was more distortion than signal it's currently at minus 30 db are you sure that's not are you sure that's not just what it sounds like anyway well when i went in and had to fiddle around with it and put things at normal levels and with a little bit of reductive eq it actually sounds pretty good like, way better than I would have yeah. expected. This is well, I suppose last... however bad we were at managing the, um, like, managing the recording technology and stuff, we at least had a vague idea of what a guitar should sound like. <laughs> I have no so. no idea how to actually make it sound like that. I remember desperately yeah. wanting to have the guitar sound off... Uh, the manufacture by Fear Factory or City by Strapping Your Lad and then ending up with something that was much more like <laughs> left hand path <laughs> crossed with thorns. Yeah. yeah. That that that's putting it fairly charitably. Uh, yeah. Uh, it does it does actually have like there's there's actually a pretty decent guitar tone buried in there. Listen to one of the guitar tracks yeah. soloed. So once you get rid of all of the static and unnecessary low end, it's actually a pretty cool, unique guitar tone in there. Yeah, I remember when we were, when we were originally uh, doing this, um, I'd been using this uh, Zoom pedal, uh, kind of, I think the GFX 707 thing, which I'd kind of made my own distortion in it, which was about the best I could get out of it. It was quite, uh, quite a kind of thin, reedy, sort of sound so it was probably actually quite good that we ended up using the uh, the bass amp because it kind of helped to kind of smooth that out a bit and bring out some of the lower tones which w just weren't getting through so if you compare it to, to how it sounds on corridors there's definitely um, more weight to it um, mm. yeah definitely so thin and reedy is kind of the hallmark yeah. of zoom distortions though that awful yeah. mid to late nineties, early two thousands digital sound that was a, a, a vibe all on its own, <laughs> whether anyone wanted it or not. Yeah. Did we have any particular uh, musical influences or references just for this song, for this particular song? Yeah, um, I mean, it didn't apply to every riff. But in doing a kind of slower song, I was definitely um, definitely trying to channel a little bit of uh, esoteric. Mm. I think that it comes through more on some riffs than others, but just the kind of, particularly the album, uh, The Pernicious Enigma. Uh, and I think it's what, what you could probably best describe as a verse riff that comes in a bit later, where you have some kind of heavily affected clean guitars mixed in. And that was um, 
Uh, a bit further on than that. I think it's after the first quick break. Yeah, that, that one. Yeah, the clean guitars and that always remind me of uh, of Esoteric. Yeah. I can't. Nothing well, that to was label, definitely but... the plan. No. <laughs> So I can't actually find. How did I remember when we made that guitar one? Is that there we, <laughs> That's the bass. Yeah, we, this isn't a very organised. Isn't organised at all. Is it? <laughs> no, it, it doesn't help that there's so many like there empty tracks, and it, it's just. What is going on? Oh, there we go. Yeah, uh, didn't we chain like three guitar pedals together? Or was that? Or did we only Probably. do that on? Um, I know, I, we did that on physical. Yes, yeah, so on physical and deleted scenes, we had the um, uh, Metal Master pedal going into the RP7 just to use the kind of amp sim on there, and then that went in. That was DI'd into. Uh, into the computer. So this is actually uh, the last one we did with properly amped up guitars in the traditional way. So for, for what that's worth, the, yeah. it, the um, for physical and deleted scenes, it was kind of, I suppose it, it, in terms of making things difficult for ourselves, it was the worst of both worlds because we had <laughs> the kind of, we, we, we didn't have the advantage of the room tone or anything like that to create to, to add any kind of feeling to it but we also didn't have all the advantages of recording using like something like guitar rig so it was, yeah but it, it, it certainly seemed like a good idea at the time it was which the is possibly idea. also our motto it was literally yeah. all that was available to us I think that's why it sounds cool yeah. is because it was making the best and being creative with the limitations that we had rather than later on where we had all of the different plugins that we also didn't know how to use and just throwing them on and hoping yeah. that it turned out okay. Yeah, which is one of those things when people say, oh, you know, it'd be great if we could kind of reproduce this particular feeling, but I, I, don't, I don't think we can reproduce it. It's such a product of those particular times and those limits and... Yeah, even down to something like the fact that I was recording guitars while my parents were out. So there's a little bit of pressure there to kind of, because yeah. I didn't want to disturb them. <laughs> so this was recorded while in, I were in doing the garden, doing the gardening at his parents' house. So to we weren't allowed to make a lot of noise while they were in. So we would yeah. do all the well, loud I don't know stuff. If it, it wasn't that we weren't. A, yeah, I don't think it was that we weren't allowed. It was just I felt really awkward about it. <laughs> um, yeah. I think that, I think all things considered, they've been extremely tolerant over the years at some of the weird stuff we've done in their house. <laughs> um, okay, so why are there so many different guitar tracks? Because just looking at the session okay. here, there's so, like, yeah, there's eight guitar tracks, but they seem to be the same. For, so it's quad tracked. But then, yeah, the the all of the guitar tracks are, um, oops, are repeated like don't cop. So there's it, it's like yeah. octo track. Yeah. So uh, four four sets of uh, of the tracks are uh, have a little bit of a high pass filter on, and the other four have a bit of a low pass filter on and I think what I was trying to do there um, the emphasis on trying is pardon me trying to reproduce uh, something like the feel of Mayhem's The Mistress album where they have this really kind of dense wall of guitars so uh, there are kind of I guess there's a couple of problems with doing that one is part of the strength of that album anyway is that the riffs are really simple so they really benefit from that whereas these generally aren't so it just kind of creates a lot more uh, a lot more mud um also unlike the mistress this wasn't able the last thing which is also really like, a, a real problem with trying to replicate that approach is that instead of doing multi-layered takes i did like a lazy shortcut where i just copied the takes and put 
and put a different EQ setting on them. So it, it kind of you, you don't get that sense of fullness at all. You just get it, it just sounds like a small number of takes, but recorded with a really weird, conflicted sound. So yeah, so that didn't uh, that didn't pan out. Um, <laughs> And uh, that also been... produced other problems in this track, but I suspect we'll get to them later. And let's talk about them now. Which other problems? Okay. Uh, well, I think I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but looking at the track, I think we did this. I think there's later on in the guitar tracks, there's kind of electronic sounds that have been put on those tracks for no reason. Yeah. Um, there they are. Yeah. So those ones, for example, and that, that, what, I have no idea why, why we did that. It's not like we were short of tracks. <laughs> um, and then, but where, where I think it particularly a, a problem later on, and I think if you go from about bar 145. Yeah, I think that'll be... Yeah, okay, here. So we've got some, I believe this was kind of some kind of, uh, oh God, what was going on here? Yeah, well, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. But anyway, because um, all the guitars were unnecessarily loud and every track had been normalized, but necessarily but when all this kind of junk noise and stuff came in we wanted it to sound bigger but we'd left ourselves no headroom to, to move into so that's kind of why everything kind of you get the sound on the on the finished album where it's like the the, the sounds are too loud for the um for the software to deal with so you get that really kind of stuttery kind of drop out sound. Um, yeah. I actually think, I think that sounds really I have a feeling cool. that a lot of that... Yeah. Well, I mean, I think... It sounds, it sounds better now that you've done a little bit of adjustment of the... Uh, of the layers. Um, yeah, I can actually hear what's going on but, uh, now. Yeah, when, when you have yeah, this, yeah. So I, and I think I've, that I've taken the master mix down to minus thirty dB. So yeah. when it's at zero dB, then it does go to shit. But I actually like it when it does that stuttering thing. It sounds really cool. Mm. I guess can't. it's one of those things where it's it, it's you can make a kind of convenient narrative after the fact where you can say, oh, it's because the sounds are kind of exceeding the. The capacity of the uh, of the speakers to deliver it's like it's a sound that's too big to force itself into our world or <laughs> something like that yeah you know the, the, the kind of stuff we always used to say to kind of cover up when we didn't know how to do uh, something in the studio yeah so i think and that's going to be um keyboards through the rp7 i think maybe or i, I think see. some guitar as well that's me Oh, that's you, definitely. Yeah. So that's me yeah. screaming into a microphone with a, a pitch bend and I, delay and distortion. I don't, I, actually, I think what that was, I think, um, I don't think it's a microphone. I think it's was it the mostly thing? that's a guitar take. And then towards the end, I think you were screaming into the pickup here. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Let's have a listen. Yeah, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Now you say I do remember doing that. Yeah. I've done that loads. Yeah. yeah, but that's just that. It's just that um, that wonderful uh, guitar effect on the RP7 that we've never been able to replicate with anything else. The, the tyrant. The uh, what? What? Yes, what we always call the tyrant sound so, after, um, which was named after the working title of a Mind Thorn song. Yep. Uh, so um, um, just yeah, explain there. Well, one of our yeah. other secret weapons, apart from Mike's Zoom 707, was my Digitech uh, RP7 
multi effects guitar unit. They, we, I thought the RP7 was cool because it had an actual valve in it, so you could get some cool guitar tones out of it. Mm -hmm. And you could also, it also had primitive amp simulation, cab simulation, so you could plug it directly into a computer uh, interface, which the uh, other pedals couldn't really do at the time. And that's what we did later on on deleted scenes running a, a metal master pedal through it as well but it had this really cool ability to assign multiple things to the expression pedal so you could have a wah and a pitch bender and so we came up with this effect called the tyrant which was meant to be like some huge undersea lovecraftian creature siren sound and we used it all over everything and, but we were never able to recreate it. You see, when the RP7 broke and I got a new one, because we, we, we used our equipment until it broke, basically. And yeah, I, I got do. one. Yeah, I got one and uh, a replacement and I was never quite able to get the same sound again. So yet another reason why we can't go back and redo music like this is because it, it, it was very much of its time. We cannot replicate those sounds. Although I so we got good mileage out of them while we could. Oh yeah, definitely. It's it's something that people talk about a lot on the music podcasts and stuff I listen to. People have over the last few years really started to to talk about how um, limitations drives creativity. Yeah. And so yeah, a, a lot of uh, hyper pop artists use limited technology to create the the sounds that they do as much as I, I know some people who like us really don't like hyperpop but it's still a pretty mm -hmm. interesting way how you can use the same approach of these are our limitations let's get the most out of it to produce completely different types of music exactly i mean that that is really fundamental to the sound of these early albums at this kind of level of sophistication Oh man, you really? to I mean, your, I'd had it. Your four track. I mean, I had a four. Yeah, because I had a four track in the way. I've, st I've still got that. And every everyone I know who's who's into who's our age and does home recording or music production at some point had a Tascam or had a friend with a Tascam four or four. Yeah. But th this was such a paradigm shift, though, and it just opened up so many possibilities, and that was. At the time, that was just incredibly exciting, and you can't, you can't kind of reproduce the the honeymoon period you have with home recording technology, where just everything is magical. Um, so I kind of take it for granted now, and uh, but yeah, at the time, I really can't stress enough how how big a deal it was, and like how how important it was to the early Axis sound to kind of take it. To, a completely stubborn DIY approach, however ill-equipped we were to <laughs> to actually manage that. It's not like we had um, any options. We didn't have any budget whatsoever. No, no, but yeah, it is. I wonder what. Yeah, but I guess a, a few years a few years ago, a band in our position trying to do the music we do would have been really, really stuck. So it was mm. really just being there at the right time on the cusp of this technology being kind of widely available was just completely made the difference oh yeah and i have to thank uh, um i have to thank a guy called david welsh for giving us a uh, cakewalk at the time he was in a band called uh, demonic rising from falkirk um and a few of those guys were in the band uh, knock and Terza now um but anyway uh, i i kind of met him while i was at university and he just opened the door to all this and we just kind of ran with it really but he, he he was a guy who kind of showed me the ropes and stuff and and also when we did the human method i think we actually sent it to him to look at the uh at the drum sounds and stuff and he gave us yeah, some advice nice. and things yeah so this is before toon well i think toon track had just started at the time but it was mm -hmm. um sample libraries that you had to use with third party separate samplers and we didn't know anything yeah. about that we just had basic midi sounds like the kinds you get off a a, t a typical Yamaha keyboard type thing yeah. uh, using a system called sound fonts to do our drums so our relentless turbo drums see if I can find them 
So here they're, they're soloed drums. And for some reason we doubled them. I don't know why. Yeah, again, I think that... No, I think it was because um, we didn't know how else to make them cut through the mix. And I think that was kind of <laughs> generally our ethos. We said, yeah, yes, it's like so. If anything can't cut through the mix, you don't turn you don't turn anything else down. No, no, no. You just uh, double up something so that it just makes the the, the, the wall of sound even more saturated and ridiculous. And I don't know if maybe one of these tracks maybe had a slightly different EQ on it, possibly or. Uh, and also yeah, this do. is the we're, sound we're... of someone who does it yeah and they're also slightly out and of so time. this is also this yeah yeah oh great <laughs> so I just but flipped this the phase is, on this them. is also the set yeah right. I just flipped the phase on but them this and is, that was this um, is... yeah and if, if they were the same exactly the same they would have cancelled so there's uh, yeah but I this think is one's got a reverb on them. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. This delay is ridiculous. Yes, that's all right. It sounds yeah. pretty <laughs> stupid. Um, in some this way, is, but it also helped give it a more kind of distinctive character at the time, which I, I know it is another thing that kind of people say they'd like to hear more of. But I can't. I can't go back to that level of ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> you can't unlearn it. But I've been in bands. Yeah, I've been in bands with real drummers for too long to kind of be uh, to, to to still like maintain that level of complete uh, just complete ignorance. Also, you've gained an understanding of how human limbs work. So yeah, which has never really been a big part of Axis, but you know, <laughs> it's more how human limbs don't work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. The drums were programmed by hand in MIDI. There was no um, mm -hmm. like MIDI packs. And no loops. Yeah, and that you could buy today. I actually, I actually still really like the tones. A lot of modern metal production, they take mm. a real drum and they try and get it to sound like this with the tones, not necessarily the playing. So considering that they were they were well, free, I think free sound, free drum tones then. And this mass of stuff here is all um, of the individual drum program parts. So yeah. we separated them out into, programmed them on one track and then separated them out onto four separate tracks and then printed them down to one stereo file. But I think one of the uh, one of the cool things about sound fonts even now is just that I think a lot of them still sound pretty good in a lot of ways, uh, particularly with some of the keyboard sounds. Like there's a particular sound font called uh, Profit Killer, which we got at the time and that we still use regularly because <laughs> yeah. it's just, I've never, it's, he never heard anything that quite reproduces that sound. It's and, literally on uh, everything I do. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's uh, meant but, to be um, um, the other a, thing. a particular patch from an original Profit 6, I think, or Poly 6 yeah. synth. Is that a keyboard? Oh, that's cool. I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember that at all. But that's that sounds pretty cool. That is definitely trying to reproduce some um, uh, Silent Hill sound effect. Oh yeah. I definitely. think you know the um, in the at the beginning of the first game where there's the scene in the um, in the diner where Harry first meets Sybil and you've got that sound <laughs> yeah. in the background that goes. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I was trying, trying. I've made multiple t attempts over the years to reproduce that. I think this was. Uh, I can't remember where you got that. Uh, the, the keyboard that we used on this. Um, that Yamaha keyboard. Yeah. I've got no idea. I know where it was I kind of. Uh, uh, it, yeah. I think, I mean, it was pretty, it wasn't like a kind of pro level bit of gear, it was kind of like a home practicing kind of keyboard. Um, but I think we've got some pretty cool sounds out of it just by running it through our effects. Yeah, this is uh, another thing that we did a lot on the early stuff is uh, we had kind of uh, MIDI lines underneath. Uh, the guitarists like playing the root notes and stuff and I think is that something we took from SYL? Yeah. Oh, there's some radio static. Yeah. 
this is a, literally a radio just sweeping backwards and forwards to find nice bits of static. Uh, yeah, and then I think we put it through a Sound Blaster Live effect, which I can't remember what it was called, but it had that kind of wobbly kind of kind of sound mm -hmm. to it. And reverb and delay. Yeah. Had we, at this point, had we found the formula of reverse it, pitch it down and cover it in reverb to make weird noises out of everyday stuff? <laughs> um, I don't know if, uh, we, we may have done it on a couple of bits. Uh, I know what I have noticed on some of the samples is that we've used uh, the kind of time stretch effect in Cakewalk, but we haven't pitched it down so you get that kind of very digital kind of artifacty um, uh, kind of time stretch effect. So the, uh, the the kind of little sample again, I think it's about bar 145, where you've got the woman from uh, Event Horizon saying no one's coming to help us. You can hear that because it's been kind of stretched to take about twice as long, but it's still the same pitch, I think. I, I always thought that added yeah. like a really cool thing, like... Yeah. No yeah. Oh, I'm not knocking it, it's just I think that was as far as we'd gotten into using the kind of time stretching things. I think we could probably figured it out a bit afterwards, maybe around the time when we did Physical Hallucinations, that um, if, if we kind of pitched it down as well and maintained that kind of um, pitch duration paradigm, consistency that uh, we'd get like better quality sounds but there was I think that there's something about that kind of very digital stretching sound that's kind of that's really characteristic of this album and I think that's that, that's kind of a cool thing it's nice that it has uh, bits of it, it its own kind of signature sound in some ways yeah no that, that's it's kind I'm of saying. fitting with the more yeah, it's kind of fitting with the more kind of science fiction vibe that we had with this album that we kind of abandoned afterwards for the kind of pure horror sound. Slithered out, uh, something for better or worse. Yeah. Excitement. Wow. <laughs> and of course, you can hear you can hear guitars in the background. <laughs> yeah, so it didn't have any headphones. Yeah. If I remember rightly, it was just um, uh, a karaoke room, a microphone from a karaoke set. Yes. And we didn't have a pop sheet. Which, which I still have. The classic Axis karaoke mic. <laughs> and then we ran that into and various I, I do, guitar I do pedals. actually still use that. I remember writing these lyrics in the... Um, in, when I was still living at, back at my mum's house, in, in, living in the attic. Right. Like, like being, uh, not being able to sleep and being awake at like three in the morning. Yeah. Um, I mean, is it a little bit of a kind of stream of consciousness thing? Cause I, I think it does kind of, the, the kind of line about being kind of half asleep, it does kind of, ring true there's a slightly kind of delirious kind of like stream of images going oh, on yeah, it, sound, that, it sounds like you were genuinely half asleep when you when you kind of just no, it was, so there was that and then just a massively massively depressed but not actually knowing what was wrong with me yeah and then and then the unpleasant situation of living with my mum and then all of the other yeah. things that were happening at the time it was just yeah mm -hmm. So let's be through the um, the. I can never remember the model, but the the, the red um, effects unit that we used for a lot of the vocals. The F one. Yes, or F yeah, something like that. Yeah. Let's just Google it. See what happens. Was it a Roland thing or a Boss thing? Or? Boss VF one. <clears throat> Boss VF one. 
Mm. So that had loads of classic Axis effects on. It had the Cult of I Heart and Necropolitan guitar sound. It had that really cool, dreamy, melty lead guitar sound that got used all over um, physical hallucinations as well. Yeah. Sadly, no longer with us. It finally, um, yeah, it finally died a year or two ago. I took it into, uh, <laughs> I took it into uh, uh, a local music shop, and they kind of treated it like some kind of ancient relic. And uh, <laughs> when that, when I asked them to look at it to, to see if they could advise how to fix it, and they said the only way to actually fix it would be to buy another one that was in working order and take bits out of it. <laughs> so the only way to fix it would be to ruin another one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as is so, the axis way. yeah so sadly yeah so sadly that uh, that went the distance but it, it had a good innings I wonder how many how many people were thought we had like some arcane studio magic that we used to get all these tones and, and sounds and it's just like yeah. was dicking about <laughs> doing the best we can with the shitty gear that we had are any of these tracks bass I'm sure we recorded bass because I yes. think you did it, but I can't. I can't remember where it is in the sound or what it's doing. Um, um, <laughs> fuzz, fuzz, fuzz. So, yeah, I can't really imagine that having all the keyboard um, root notes will have kind of helped it stand out in the mix. But I just, it's got to be in there. So, is, is that it? Yeah, here's the bass. Just a, a DI through mm. pedals to, straight into the computer. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> normalised. <because laughs> normalised. Normalised. Yeah, it is. The, the waveform is literally just chunk. Yeah, it's, it, that's. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. The secret I, is, I, I don't know why we thought that was a good idea. The real secret, though, is panning it 1% to the right <laughs> for no damn reason. <laughs> <laughs> Despite what it sounds like, I am being quite meticulous here trying to get the performances right. And it's not just about getting the notes in the right order, it's also like because we use a lot of kind of uh, well, well, a lot of the feel of Axis Rift comes out of the kind of artificial sense of harmonics generated by the strings ringing together in different ways. So sometimes the way I'm playing things isn't the sensible way to play that sequence of notes, but it's just to kind of incorporate some of that weird jangly sound that you get from using the strings in a particular way. And yeah, so it kind of, it's very difficult to do that unless you kind of chop things up into little bits and just try and kind of micromanage every every take really. But again, yeah, I think it's just, um, I don't know what it says about Axis Rifts generally, but I find, I find I get quite kind of panicky while I'm trying to record them. And I think that's probably uh, uh, just another aspect of the sound, really. So I've I'm got no one to blame for myself for that. Trying to bend your fingers in ways that they're not meant to bend. Yeah. And Brooke also has this theory where... Um, Sorry, it's theory that uh, because I play left-handed, that affects the kind of riffs I write, and I don't know if there's anything in that. I know you can, um, <laughs> yeah. with some left-handed guitarists, like uh, like Gregor McIntosh, he's got a kind of distinctive, weird uh, approach to melody in his solos. That, he does, doesn't he? Uh, I, I don't know if it's yeah, I don't, and I don't know if it's something to do with that. Or if I'm just um, if I'm just spinning a yarn, but it's it, it's interesting. There could be something in it. No, I can always tell your riffs. They always like, even no matter what kind of style you're playing in, it's always like it always sounds like weird, wonky left-handed <laughs> riffs. I guess uh, the only thing <laughs> the only thing we haven't talked about is just some of the other some of the other DIY things that we that we had to do to to kind of make the recording work. Like um, because we we're recording in my bedroom. Uh, one thing it took a long time was getting the mic placement sort of correct for the amp and we and basically we, we, we had to um, because we didn't have any mic stands we just had to experiment with different piles of objects to get the right height for the mic so I think what we uh, I know we tried um, we had because I have family 
who lived in Zimbabwe at the time, I had this animal hide drum and we used that as the bass. And then I think on top of that, I think the first thing we tried was we had a beer can and then we sell it the mic to the top of that. And then that wasn't quite the right height. So I think then we had a, a measuring jug and uh, that kind of sat on the base of the drum and then that, that, that was about right. And then when, when you were re recording your vocals, uh, my mum had a, a hat stand which is about the right height, so we just sellotaped uh, the mic to that. There's also a little bit of the kind of, sort of kind of early industrial attitude to it, of just making sounds with anything to hand and kind of probably a actively avoiding the conventional ways of doing things as well. Though I don't know if we really kind of thought it through to that extent. Um, but definitely I think because we'd done the, um, the recordings for Pulse Sphere the year before, which where we used a lot of kind of household objects and things just to make sounds as well as kind of the kind of guitar effects and stuff and i think that kind of set the stage for a lot of the kind of experiments we did with this album mm -hmm. yeah well i think this one definitely um this definitely set the tone for what we did next i think i, I remember thinking that at the time that there was so we'd done one album that was full of these really abrasively fast songs and then we kind of finished off with this one and thought oh, actually there's quite a lot of mileage and kind of doing the kind of slower and um, feeling i think one last thing so, that we haven't really covered though then is yeah. how the guitar riffs go together because they're quad so we will not necessarily duplicate them but they're quad tracked on purpose yeah because the, the four the four well, basic think... tracks are playing different things Yeah, and I think, uh, th th again, this is something that we kind of hadn't really capitalised on with it, Newman, that it kind of dealt with more later. Um, I think I'd kind of just about grasped the idea that quad tracking was a good idea from, from a kind of normal uh, recording perspective. and But I think it was more on later releases, particularly... Um, Starting from physical and developing more undeleted scenes and then again in tournaments where uh, instead of just quad tracking you get four tracks which all have little individual variations in them mm -hmm. so you get a much kind of denser, more kind of twisted um, texture of sounds so and I think that, that's, that's another kind of signature part of the uh, the axis sound really that when when we are quad tracking there's lots of little kind of deviations that are happening are all against each other but I don't think we're we've really kind of got the hang of that with this one I think uh, a lot of it is just kind of regular quad tracking where there's two lots of each part but, yeah so um, it, where it's actually there's actually six individual guitar parts so there's there's yeah. the, the fiddly guitars this stuff <laughs> is being quad tracked and then these underlying power cords oh okay <laughs> I've it's forgotten that it's also long ago yeah. now yeah well we were just putting the finishing touches to this album this time like just after Christmas, 18 years ago. So even though it's not released until, even though it wasn't released until March or maybe May, I can't actually remember. Um, uh, <laughs> this album is now uh, old enough to drink. <laughs> and, uh, uh, oh man. Yeah. Oh. I'm just okay. trying to think if there's anything else. that I think we've pretty much covered everything for, uh, yeah. for this song and Ick Newman in general. Um, what I was just going to say very, very quickly, uh, just an extra thing, is obviously the, there are a number of samples uh, in this song from Event Horizon, which was obviously kind of a big influence at the time. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I was One thing that I always kind of want to say about the kind of horror influences in Axis is I think people often expect it to be kind of jump scare style horror things and then complain that we don't, that the music isn't scary. 
and I think uh, I don't I don't know if we ever went as far as to actually intend it to be scary it's kind of I think the horror influence as far as I've been concerned has always been maintaining a consistent like undertone of dread so that kind of feeling you get watching something like uh, like uh, the first ring film mm. where there's not much in the way of kind of big shocks or anything there's just a kind of queasy feeling all the yeah. way through of what's going to happen and that's always been the kind of horror influence for me it's that kind of unpleasant yeah unpleasant queasy feeling 